Good morning, church. Good morning. Well, we're trying something new. For those of you that are online, hopefully you can hear a little bit better this morning. We have an external mic attached to the camera, so hopefully that makes it easier to hear. And for those of you that might be casting to your TV, you might have to turn the TV down, which is what we're hoping for. So uh, we're glad you're all here this morning. It is a beautiful weekend. Um, the sun has been out. The temp Diane said yesterday, I wish I was like this all the time. Yeah. This is my kind of weather. I'm thinking that's heaven. Soon enough. Maybe too soon for some of us. But uh, I, I'm sorry, Danny. Happy birthday. Thank you. <laughs> we already sang to him, so if you all want to sing to him online, you can do that. But um, just have some announcements this morning. Uh, I can't believe next week is Orange Track already. Um, it is our ninth race of the season. I think it's race 162 uh, overall after 17 seasons, so uh, quite a big deal. Um, registration at 9.30 with uh, racing starting at about 10, because if people are kind of trickling in, we, we hold. Um, we aren't that strict. Um, it's called grace. We teach that here. <laughs> And then, uh, as far as the movie's concerned, so everybody's been kind of wondering, well, what's the next movie going to be? What's the next movie? Well, this is what it's going to be. Alaska, Christmas is the biggest celebration of the year. This is the only time of year the entire world has this, like, shared experience. Peace, and you know, hope, and future. A raising cup to each man Merry Christmas! But that's all about to change. Is someone new moving into town? Look at that! Well, 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 there's the ring, brothers. Have a look at you, boy. Mitch Bright stopped by town today. High school Mitch Bright? You had a high school rival. So what did you guys compete over? Football, basketball, mom. I won that one. Why did you come back here after so many years? What's he after? A formal complaint has been filed about the town Christmas decoration. We'll file this complaint. The Grinch? Mitch Bright. Now to save Christmas. Joe, what are you doing? Season's greetings? It works for everybody. It doesn't work for me. Do you really care about City Hall decorations? I do have a problem with Christmas. And all the rest of the garbage you Christians have been jamming down my throat since I was a kid. Dan must save his job. You want to run for mayor of this town, try to change it? You go ahead, try it. Get the help of his friends. Mitch Bright has a personal vendetta against me. You can't have a religious display on the site. I mean, please come back. Back off! We are not going to cave in. And the love of his family. The reason for the season. It's not going anywhere. You heard what the judge said. That doesn't mean that you can ruin Christmas for everybody else here. I'm not going to let you hold this town hostage. Tell me again, what? Just because God's out of vogue in the big city doesn't mean we throw them away like last summer's fashion magazine. Brad Stein. Her nativity scene that we had for 50 years, and he's like, oh, gee, we got to sue somebody. Nancy Stafford. If you spend less time worrying about our rights and more time worrying about others' needs, I think we might actually be doing it ourselves. And Daniel Baldwin. American culture is not limited to this small town bubble. Sometimes what really needs saving is the human heart. A little angel told us that we didn't get a proper welcome when we came to town. Thought we better take care of that. And the true spirit of Christmas. Christmas starts with a capital C. Christmas with a capital C. Facebook moderators won't pull that down on us. Yeah. But um, this is a great movie. Diane and I have both seen this. It, uh, it's got a great message that fits today's world very well. So we invite you to join us on November 19th. We're going to kind of do it uh, right before Thanksgiving because as soon as Thanksgiving hits, everything else is just uh, a blur. And we do want to get uh, Caroling snuck in on a Saturday there too, coming in December. So watch for that update coming soon. Um, other than that, um, I don't have any other announcements this morning, so let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the beautiful day that you provided for us, Father. We thank you for the word that you've given to Pastor Mark this morning. This word on, uh, as we go through this series, Predecide and the Keys to Overcoming Temptation, Father. Let us hear the words that you have given to him and let us take them to heart. Let us take them and walk out of this place and use them and make them a part of who we are. Father, we thank you for all your many blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. 
So this morning's call to worship comes from Psalm 16, verses 8 through 11. And it says this, I know the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. No wonder my heart is glad and I rejoice. My body rests in safety, for you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. You will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. Now that might sound a little familiar because both Paul and Peter will quote this psalm in the New Testament as they speak of Christ's bodily resurrection. And this psalm, therefore, has been often called a messianic psalm, a psalm uh, that, again, is quoted about the resurrection of Jesus. It's a psalm that expresses confidence in the Lord. And it's difficult to tell sometimes when you're in a crisis. And I think of the folks in Florida right now and uh, certainly South Carolina as it got hit, as it came back inland and the mess that is made and the death that it has brought. But even in crisis, even in those times where we think that there's nothing else, that we just can't get through, God is there. And we have an immediate application of this psalm for David and the Old Testament saints. It's something that they can grab onto and hold onto, and it refers to a deliverance from that immediate threat of death. Because no matter what happens here, no matter what happens here, no matter what people do to you or what people say to you, and this movie trailer is, is fits right in because it talks about what is happening to our our faith and, and what people are treating it. Seasons greetings rather than Merry Christmas, things of that nature, things that I, I truly feel like an attack on our faith we have this promise that no matter what happens, that we will receive his joy when we are in his presence and we will live forever. Father, as we prepare again to hear this message that you have given to Mark, let us hear the words. Let us meditate on it. Father, be with Mark. I know that he had a migraine last night and I pray that that does not come back and that he is able to concentrate and to focus on your word. Guide us through this message, Father. Let us hear everything that you have for us, not just in this message, but in this series and all the teachings that we try to do here at Grace Street. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, church. How's everybody doing today? Beautiful, bright, sunny day out there. Temperature is perfect. Weather is perfect. Mm -hmm. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And if you haven't had the opportunity to go over and, and visit our international tray of treats this morning, uh, we have brownie, or no, I'm sorry, not brownie, on, pumpkin now. bars, Good and time. we have uh, Belgian chocolates over there, and we've got uh, Canadian um, maybe, yes, there we go. Temptation should have been here. I know some of you are at the hospital right now, but should have been here. Yeah. Uh, anyway, we have, we have uh, uh, great treats and everything to kind of celebrate the day and, and to start the day off right. And so uh, as we progress through our uh, pre-decision series that we're doing here. This is the second week in our pre-decide better choices for a better life. And so as we go through there, one of the uh, synonyms for choice, obviously, is the word decisions. Decisions, decisions, decisions. Good morning. Come on in. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Terry was just bringing the tray of treats around, so you're just in time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta have the treats. <laughs> So last week we heard from Pastor Terry that on the average, we as adults, uh, consciously and unconsciously, make about 35,000 decisions per day. 35,000 decisions a day. So we kind of fall into this decision fatigue or decision overload. So today I want to talk about kind of 
planning and overcoming temptations that uh, may make us make bad decisions. And, well, I don't know about you, but I don't know anybody, and as we're handing out the treat, I don't know anyone who has ever planned to be 40 pounds overweight. Have you? <laughs> no, you know, you really don't plan for those kind of things as we pass around the treats. <laughs> and I don't know about anybody that you know of, but I don't know anybody who has ever had a five-year goal to become bankrupt. Not so much, right? I don't know anybody who has ever really thought, I want to be hooked on pornography. Now, I know some people who like pornography, but I don't anyone know of anyone who wants it to wreck their life, wreck their marriage, and take them to a place where they really shouldn't go in life. And I don't know anyone who plans to do something stupid or something sinful and then hide it and lie about it and lose the trust of the people that they love the most. See, I don't know anyone who plans to wreck their life. And the chances are really, really good when it comes to you, you're not planning to make any of those stupid decisions. The problem is... For most people, they don't plan to do stupid things. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And it's something that I believe has a great amount of potential for impact in your life in a very, very powerful way. <clears throat> so first, what I want to do is we're going to kind of cover what we covered last week a little bit in here. We talked about the power of decisions uh, because for the most part, we need to understand that the quality of our decisions determines the quality of our lives. So if we're making bad decisions all the time, you're not going to have the best life that you could have. However, if you plan ahead of time and pre-decide, which is what this whole series is about, we can move you towards better decisions and ultimately having a better life. In other words, we make our decisions and then our decisions make us. They make our lives what they are. And so I think that's very, very important for people to get that in their heads because this is the basis for how you can decide and how you can live a better life. So the problem is, although we have all of the good intentions out there, many of us are simply not really good decision makers. And that's why last week, uh, Terry introduced a big idea called the power of pre-deciding, the power of choosing ahead of time what we're going to do in the future. So that power of pre-deciding what we're gonna do in the future in here is gonna keep us from making spur of the moment fast decisions which could be bad decisions in the process. And if you were here last week, we introduced the, the big idea that we find this all over scripture, choosing ahead of time what we will do in the moment. And we introduced the concept that when we're faced with what kind of scenario, whatever it happens to be, how we spend our money, what we say, what to look at, how to treat somebody, where to go, where not to go, what to do or where not to do. See, so we're faced with that decision process all over again. So if we are faced with a certain situation that we've already pre-named, then we're going to make a decision to make a certain type of action ahead of time instead of waiting until the moment to give in to some kind of temptation or let our emotions take us to a place that we really don't want to go, we're pre-deciding then what we're going to do. And it's really a very, very simple process. We kind of work through the things that we do on a regular basis and we decide, okay, I could be making a bad decision if I just kind of go with the emotions and go with the flow at that point in time. It's probably not going to get me where I want to be. So we pre-decide, if this happens, I'm going to decide to do this. And that's kind of where we're taking everybody through this series. So this week, what I want to do is I'm going to introduce six I am statements. Now, most people in here, I used to teach this in business class, but an I am statement means that you are making a commitment to a certain behavior. Okay? So an I am statement is a grounding statement. It's a statement, it can be a statement of affirmations as well. So, 
I want to talk about these I am statements that we have. And we have a new perspective that we're trying to form on our lives in here. And we're deciding who we're going to be into the future. So these I am statements are kind of the foundation that we lay in order to make good decisions going forward. So let's review those. Let's talk about what we're going to decide to be. Or better yet, who we're going to decide to be. So an I am if we take a look at what it says in the scriptures, it says that God is the great I am, and we are created in God's image, and so we kind of inherit some of these properties and qualities that God has, and that we see through the scriptures uh, that God has for his people, and we are his people. So what are we going to say? Say it with me, will you? What are you? Well, I am ready. Okay. I am consistent, I am devoted, I am generous, I am faithful, I am a finisher. Now, I'm not sure how that happened, but I had I am devoted in there with a capital D on it. And the reason for that is I kind of want to em emphasize what it means to be devoted to something. It means that you've made an internal commitment to an external activity or to an ideal. So being devoted to something means that you're, you're saying, I'm going to take this as an active part of my life. And that's very, very important for us to understand. So we're going to pretend that had a capital D on it. I'm not sure what happened to it, but you know, in here it is. <laughs> so one more time, I'm ready, I'm consistent, devoted, generous, faithful, and I am a finisher. So did you notice anything about those statements? They're all positive values. They're all positive values. There's no negatives in there. We're not unprepared, inconsistent, uncommitted, stingy, unfaithful, a quitter. See, no one would want to intentionally have those negative qualities, those negative values, as the foundation for their lives, as the foundation for how they make their decisions through life. We don't want to do that. Nobody wants to be a quitter. Nobody wants to start out with the ambition to become a failure, right? Nobody. But see, it's those negative traits that come out when we're unprepared to face certain decisions that we have to make in life each and every day. If we start off with a good foundation of being prepared, being consistent in what we do, being devoted and committed to that ideal and activity, being generous with ourselves, our time, and what we're gifted with. That is, everybody always equates generous with money. And it doesn't have to be money. There's a lot more things in life that are much more valuable than money. I am faithful, meaning I'm going to follow through with what I do. I am going to be who I commit to be. I'm going to do what I commit to do. And so... As some negative traits come out, we're unprepared to make certain decisions that we have to make. If we have this as our foundation, we start in a good place. So I like to think of, when I was writing this out, I thought of this movie, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. So that's all back in 1938. And Indiana Jones was forced to enter into the temple to find the grail in order to save his father, who had been shot by... Uh, another character in there, Walter Donovan. And Jones made it past all these assorted traps and tests to get into that inner sanctum where he encountered the Grail Knight. And the knight says to him, you must choose, but choose wisely, for the true Grail will bring you life, and a false Grail will take it from you. So when they're trying to choose this grail and this room is just filled with all these different goblets and, and uh, what they call grails. And we're trying to choose that grail out of all the goblets in the room. And if they choose wisely, it leads to life. And if they choose poorly, well, they die right then and there. Done and done. It's kind of a final choice. So Donovan in the movie, he chooses this jewel-encrusted golden goblet because, see, he was greedy at heart. So his heart led him to make that choice. 
Well, this is the Goblet of Akeem. It's got jewels and it's filled with gold and everything. Well, he chose poorly. And he died right then and there. And see, in life, it's, uh, there's a lot of metaphors in that, in that movie. But in life, it's the same thing. Some of our decisions will have immediate consequences and others will have long-term consequences. All decisions have consequences. It's like the physics law that says for every action, there will be an equal and opposite reaction. Well, in life, for every decision we make, there will be a consequence, whether it's a short-term consequence or a long-term consequence. That's why it's imperative for us to be prepared to make good decisions, to choose wisely. And that's why we need this foundation. When we pre-decide, our decisions won't be based on what feels good in the moment or what looks good in the moment, but on who you want to be for the rest of your life. They're based on values because when our values are clear, our decisions are easier. When we have that foundation, those become our values. That's our value system that we talk about. So let's dive into that. When we have good values, we are going to make better decisions. I won't say every decision is going to be great, but we will make better decisions in the process. So I want to ask you a question. How many of us have ever given in to temptation and then regretted it afterwards? <laughs> oh, come on now. Everybody, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So chances are, in most cases, you gave in to the temptation because you weren't ready. You weren't ready to make that decision. You weren't prepared ahead of time. You hadn't planned ahead of time. In fact, Scripture talks over and over again of telling us we need to be prepared because our enemy is going to attack. And being prepared, when I went to look this up, is mentioned 321 passages in the Bible. So I think it's pretty important, right? In fact, the Apostle Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Be on your guard and stand firm in the faith. Be courageous be strong. Notice those are different statements. Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. Be ready because your enemy is attacking. Don't let your guard down. Have your guard up instead. Be ready because he's coming. It is a matter of if he comes, it's when he comes. And Paul said that Jesus said in Matthew 26, he said, watch and pray. Watch and pray. Why? So you're ready. So you don't fall into temptation. Because your spirit wants to do what's right, but your flesh is often very weak. That's why we're going to pre-decide that we are ready, and that our guard is up, and we are watching, and we are praying. Why are we watching and praying? comes down really to two basic reasons, two major reasons. Number one is spiritual warfare. And I need to tell you number one because the devil is coming for you. Our spiritual enemy has a mission to steal, kill, and destroy anything and everything that matters to the heart of God. In fact, it was the Apostle Paul who said this in 2 Corinthians 2.9. He says, I wrote to you, why? So that Satan, the father of lies, will not outsmart us, for we are familiar with his evil schemes. Well, in order for us to be familiar with his evil schemes, in order for us to know what's going on and when he's going to attack us, we have to be able to recognize those symbols. We need to stop and pray and listen for what's going on. See, because he's studying you. He knows where you are. And he knows where you're weak. He knows when you're vulnerable and he knows how to attack you to take you out of God's will and hurt you and the people around you. So we're going to be ready. 
because we know that the devil is coming for us. And number two, the second point that we have to think about is pride. Okay, pride's a tough one. Pride's a real tough one to deal with because we tend to think that we can handle a lot, a lot more than what we can actually handle. We can actually handle. Think about that one once. Because that's the action statement. So we tend to think that we are stronger than what we really are. Okay? And there's a very sobering warning in scriptures. And it says, if you think you're standing strong, be careful not to fall. The temptations in your life are no different than from what others experience. think you're standing strong, be careful not to fall. God is faithful in all that he does, and he prepares us along the way. He gives us his word, his endorsed word that we have in the Bible. That means that God said, I am inspiring this person to write it so that you will know what to do should you come upon this situation. He wants us to be ready. He wants us to be informed. we got to do our part. Number one, we have to know the word. we got to read it, right? So we have to be informed. We have to be prepared to face what comes our way. See, he's not going to allow that temptation to be more than what we can stand if we stand in faith with God. Okay? When you're tempted, he will show you a way out that, so you can endure. Now notice what I said. When you are tempted, it doesn't say he's going to take away all temptation. It doesn't say he's going to take away all stress and strife out of your life. All the problems, all the different things we have to deal with. That's all part of life. It's how it builds our character as we go through. It's how we learn to live life. is by facing those things. But see, if we are faithful to him, it says that... He will never give us anything more than what we can endure. So the scripture says to you, Hey you, you who think you're standing firm, be careful. Because when you're overly confident, that's when we tend to fall. If you think you're standing firm, be careful so that you don't fall. And that's why we often end up on a place that we don't want to be. Because we make decisions that don't include and honor God. Did you take that That decision to God first and say, hey, you got the answers. How about let me know what I should do in this instance? Or do you just kind of go, Meh, I got this. I'll make the decision on my own. So there's been a lot of studies that are going on here, and studies are very fascinating. They show that people vastly overestimate their ability to resist temptation. And it's amazing to see. I mean, you got to Google temptation once and just see these 16 million, whatever it was, I can't remember the exact number of, of hits that come back to that when you're talking about temptation. So there's a lot of temptation going on. Over 16 million hits on one word, just one word. So these studies show that people overestimate their ability to resist temptation. We think we're really stronger than what we actually are. And the technical term for this is known as what is called restraint bias. Restraint bias. Meaning we're trying to restrain ourselves, however, we're unfamiliar or unprepared or not ready to be able to face what we're actually facing. And so you think you can fight off more than what you can fight off. And that's why, you know, when they bring those pumpkin bars into church, you think you can just walk by them. And you do the first time. And then you hear them calling your name. And you walk by again, second time. And next thing you know, you got frosting all over your face, and you don't know how it happened to you. This is called restraint bias. This is what it's all about. Now, I'm not naming names of who brings the pumpkin bars or anything. Uh, but I wouldn't do that. No initials, no nothing. Okay, I'll admit it. I bought them. Uh, but why? Why did we end up with the frosting on our face? Because you thought you could handle more than what you can actually handle. So why is that? 
Why do we tend to overestimate our ability to fight off the wrong things? And one of the reasons is because we have no idea how much energy it takes us to make all the decisions we have to make. 35,000 conscious and unconscious decisions per day. That's wearing on itself. But then when temptation comes in, see, we have to try and restrain against temptation on top of it. And it literally drains us. Spiritually, we become fatigued. Mentally, we become fatigued. And the part of our brain that controls willpower, well, it just flat wears out. We can say that willpower wanes in the process. And that's the very reason you end up with frosting on your face. And unfortunately, it kind of happens again and again. So then it comes back to why you're 40 pounds overweight. But, see, we have to face those decisions. We have to face those temptations. We have to face all the things that are going to come at us each and every day. Because we don't wake up one day and everything else is gone. We still have to face those same decisions. We have to face those temptations day in and day out each and every day of your life. How about you ever work with anybody who's crazy? Mm. It's like all day long they make you crazy and you're wanting to unleash it. But you're godly and you fight it off and you fight it off and you fight it off and then you go home and you yell at your spouse you make good decisions all day long, but then you hit that willpower end and it's, I'm done. And you just need that one little thing to set you off. And what happens? You make a bad decision and you probably say or do something you shouldn't do. I'm not saying this is me. But I'm just throwing that out there as an example. <laughs> okay, Terry. <laughs> He's back there doing one of these numbers. So you make good decisions all day long and you come home and you binge eat because your willpower starts to wane. Our self-control, our willpower is gone. It's a limited resource. The more we use it, the less of it we have. So it, it has to recover, it has to have time to reset itself, and it has to rebuild. When we don't make snap decisions, it may cause ourselves, our, I'm sorry, when we do make snap decisions, it may cause distress on ourselves or on someone else very close to us. So how do we combat that type of bad decision making? Well, we all need to understand up front that the devil's coming for you. And you're not as strong as what you think. So what we're gonna do is we're going to pre-decide to be ready. So what I wanna share with you today is what we call the three keys to fighting temptation. And we're gonna Go ahead and pre-decide three things. So what are we going to pre-decide? Well, number one, we're going to pre-decide to move the line. And I'll go through these points here in a little bit more detail in just a moment. We're going to pre-decide to magnify the cost. And we're going to pre-decide how to plan your escape. We're going to be ready because our spiritual enemy is coming at us. He's coming for us. The first thing I want to talk about is to demonstrate to you is how you're going to pre-decide ahead of time to move the line. Now, moving the line is probably a brand new concept to you. And in fact, you know, I'm, I really want to use a, a really amazing illustration. Anybody here have a roll of gaffer's tape? Anybody? Terry, wow, that's incredible. That's incredible, my goodness. How amazing, what, what a coincidence. He happens to have a roller gaffer's tape right with him right there. Nice big one. Look at how great our God is, right? <laughs> what a coincidence. Okay, well let's bring that up here. We're, go we're gonna give a little illustration today. <laughs> if I can peel the tape back right there. Hey, how about that? So we're gonna make a line out of this tape. We're going to stretch the line across here. Yeah. 
Anybody know what gaffer's tape is? So if you're a person like me who does sound engineering, you probably have many rolls of this around here for when we have the band and you're setting up for the band, you strap down all the cables to the stage and everything so nobody trips. It's really neat stuff about it is it's sticky, but it doesn't leave the goo behind. So you can tape it on chairs and no harm, no foul. So we, we set up our line in here. We're gonna pre-decide that we're gonna move the line. Well, it doesn't look very movable. I know we can move the chairs, but let's say it's a permanent line. So, we're gonna assume that on this side of the line is sin. This side of the line is right and good. So this side of the line is, is sin, that side of the line is good. So this is kind of a neat concept. Okay, so this side of the line is God's will, that side of the line is against God's will. And this is wrong and dangerous on that side of the line. And on this side of the line, it's right. This side of the line is God honoring. That side of the line is sin. That doesn't bode well for you guys here on the wrong side of the line. <laughs> Maybe I should have made the line go this way. Well, anyway. <laughs> I'm just waiting for everybody to stand up. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, everybody's going to fill in the front rows for a change. I'm just going to move the line. Ah, I see. So what we typically do as we're, aren't you glad you came doing uh, So typically what we do is we know the line's there, right? Everybody can see the line, even though sometimes it's an imaginary line. But we can see. So what we want to do or what we do in our human nature is we want to walk right up to that line. And if you don't want to cross over the line, we want to walk right up the line. We want to walk up to that border of sin. We want to kind of do what's right, but well, you know, it's temptate, temptation that overcomes us and causes us to cross over that line at times. So, when there's a line somewhere, what do most of us do? We push the boundary. We walk up to the line. We may not cross it to begin with. To begin with. We know the line's there, and we want to push that boundary to the very limits, right? So think about it before we were Christians. The line didn't exist. The line didn't exist. There was no right and wrong or Christian boundaries, if you will, or moral boundaries, if you will. You were free to cross that line all you wanted to. But when you became a Christian... You made a commitment, right? You made a commitment to God, and you invited God into your heart. And he lets you know what's right and wrong. He gives you free will. So you can come up to that line. You can cross over the line if you make that choice. And when you make that choice to go into sin, to do what's wrong, to do what's against God's will, and again, remember, every time we make a decision, there's what? Consequences, right? consequences, short-term consequences or long-term consequences, okay? So why do we do that? Why do we do that? When you became a Christian, you learned about all these boundaries you have. Basically, you learn right from wrong at that point in time. We know what God's will is. We know that God's will is right. We know that Satan's will is wrong. And there's this constant spiritual warfare that goes on between what's on one side of the line and what's on the other side of the line. And Satan's doing his best to have us cross that line every time he can convince us to do so. And I know some of you are saying to yourselves, well, my parents taught me all about these rough boundaries, right? When we were kids, mom and dad told us what was right and what was wrong. And I have a question for you. Why are you still doing the things that have you crossing those boundaries? Why are you doing those things? Hmm. Halo's looking a bit tarnished right now, isn't it? We learn what God sets for our boundaries, and then you say for yourself, wow. You look at yourself, and you reflect on who you are and what you've done, and you go, I'm never getting to heaven. Right? But it's not over yet. 
Who here has not ever had that cross their mind? Because what I've done, what I've said, I'm never going to get to heaven. I think that's crossed through most people's minds. Because we want to get right up to the line. We want to do as much as we possibly can. Right? Does anybody here know what I'm talking about? Don't just sit there and polish your halos today. We all do that. So right there, I've got this really neat little bowl of apples. And they're honey crisp apples, not just any kind of apples. Now they're just right. They're sweet, but not too sweet. And they're tart, but they're not too tart. Just right. So, now to get to those apples, hmm. well, got to see where the line is and get a good fix on the line. But to get to those apples, I got to kind of, oh, I got to stretch over and grab an apple quick. But I really didn't cross the line, right? I mean, my toes stayed over here, right? But I never crossed it. So that doesn't count, does it? Does it? Let they who are without sin stand. Okay. Yeah, it counts. It counts. We reached over the line. We reached over that boundary. We pushed the limits of the boundary. And because that apple is so beautiful, so tempting, so sweet, but not too sweet, so tart, but not too tart, we crossed over that boundary because we gave in to temptation and we made a bad decision. I'm not saying honey crisp apples are bad, because <laughs> I love them. Uh, but the thing about it is, we sin in our lives. We cross over the line on a regular basis. We've all sinned in our lives. We've, we've all told that little white lie sometime or another, but it was small, so it didn't really hurt anyone, right? So I'm okay. I'm okay. I got away with it. Nobody knew. So I told that little white lie, but nobody knew. Yeah, we took a bite of that apple. Remember in Genesis? God drew a line. He says, you can eat of any tree in the garden in here except for the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He had a line. He had a boundary. He says, you can do whatever you want to in this garden. You have a perfect life. You have a life without pain, no sickness, no death. There was no death at that point in time. He says, if you don't eat of that fruit of that tree, everything's great. He had a boundary. He had a line. But temptation came into play. He kind of reached over the line, took a bite of that apple. That's what happens each and every time that we sin. We reach over the line. We take a bite of that apple. But see, what's really intriguing about that whole thing is, what is truly intriguing is that we may justify crossing that line about something, knowing and justifying that, oh, it's no big deal. But the things that we really know are dangerous in our lives, the things that we know would really, really cross that boundary, we never do that. So for an example, and I was going to bring in my saw this morning, but I didn't. I'm working with a power saw, and I'm pushing wood towards that blade, razor sharp blade spinning at 2,000 RPM, and with nothing but my fingers, and I'm wondering, hmm, how close can I get to that blade before I chop my fingers off, right? We all do that, right? Yeah, no, 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 no. See, I'd never do that. What I do when I know that it's really dangerous is I stay away from the line. I stay away from that spinning blade because I know it's going to take those fingers off. And once it does, it's all over. Done and done. Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Done and done. So when we know it's obvious, we stay away from the line. We stay away from that line. 
Okay, got that concept? When we know it's really dangerous, it becomes uh, an auto response and we don't cross the line. How do we do that with the things that seem to be small in our lives? The little white lies we take. Those kind of things that you can kind of justify, right? We know our spiritual enemy is coming at us and what we're going to do is when we know that there is a line of sin, we're going to move that line and stay away from sin. We're going to move that line back so that we can't reach those apples. We can't get to that temptation. We need to stop and realize that this is wrong. I'm not going to go and get up there and get as close as I can. No, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move that line. So how will this play out? And I, I did... I was going on the internet and they were talking about people and their excesses and addictions. And they talk about cyber addiction. And basically it's the use of cell phones and all the things that go along with it. So how will this play out? Let's say you look at how much time you spend on social media on your cell phone and it's like four and a half hours a day. Now if you think that sounds like a lot, Literally, they're talking about here in the studies that they've had that the people who are addicted to this cyber addiction are spending a minimum of four and a half hours a day on their cell phones. But let's listen to it a little bit further, right? Maybe that doesn't seem like it's that, that bad a thing to start with. But see, in that time, in that four and a half hours a day, you push everything else aside. You ignore the world around you. That comes to driving. How many people have ever seen anybody texting and driving? And their car is swerving back and forth through the lanes at 70 miles an hour. I've almost been run off the road, I can't tell you how many times this year, by people doing that exact thing. See, they can't leave that cell phone alone. But that's not all. They push aside their family. They push aside work. They push aside everything else in the world because they have to be on that cell phone. And I'm not saying cell phones are bad. Terry Meeks is living with things. <laughs> and I know you've got some very interesting friends, right? But they're not that interesting, trust me. Okay? <laughs> you need to live your life. You only get one. Now, if you want to take a look at it, there's some very sobering statistics and pictures that go along with them of people who have been texting and driving and got in an accident and killed themselves, killed the rest of the people in their car, and killed the people around them because they were addicted to that cell phone. They pushed the entire world aside so they could make that text go. It's not worth it. Live your life. You only get one. So what happens? They've lost their life in the process of being addicted to that cyber device. Right? So when they didn't get their life back, what you're going to do is you're going to move away from that line. Move away from that which is distracting you. And you're going to put limitations in place. Well, let's say you're going to only look, look at that cell phone device for 30 minutes a day. And not when you're driving, or in the company of your family, or your friends, or your work. But then you have to move on. you got to move away from it. See, you're moving that line back. You're taking that temptation from doing something that could be very, very dangerous out of your life, you're moving that line away. You're making a conscious choice to move the line. You predetermine the solution and then you need to commit to it. What you're going to do is you're going to move the line and make it harder to succumb to temptation. You're going to put safeguards in place to keep you from getting to the line. So do you see what we're doing here? We've placed a barrier then to temptation. We put up something as a defense shield to keep us from getting tempted 
beyond what we can handle because we know that we're not strong enough to handle these things. And it's so easy to come to temptation. Listen to what David said in Psalm 16.6. He said, The boundary lines for me, they've fallen in pleasant places, and surely I have a delightful inheritance. So what does that mean? What does inheritance have to do with boundaries? Well, very simply put, think about what it means. The boundary lines for me, they fall in pleasant places. So he's built that barrier to temptation. And so what he's going is, what he's saying is, surely I have a delightful inheritance. I'm going to inherit good things from moving the line. I'm going to inherit good things in my life from that putting up a barrier to temptation. I'm moving away from sin. And so my life is going to be better in the process. When you don't have to worry about the line, it's incredibly freeing. It's not limiting what you can do in your life. It's freeing you up from that temptation and having to be tempted and making a bad decision. The second thing we're going to do is we're going to magnify the cost. We're going to magnify the cost because anytime we're tempted to give in to temptation, there's always a risk. And we kind of talked about that earlier in here. When we make a bad decision, we've got to choose wisely, right? Because if we don't choose wisely, well, we could die. I think God said that in the Garden of Eden, right? He said, if you eat from this tree of the, of the fruit of good and evil in here, you will surely die. What happened? They ate from the tree, and they died a spiritual death. There was a separation between God and man. But what else happened? Remember? They were in the Garden of Eden. It was a place of perfection. There was no death, no pain, no suffering, no disease in the Garden of Eden. See, we died to that death. Those things died, they went away. Man became mortal. Our days of our lives are not to be numbered past 120. So there was a limit on our lives. Women had pain through childbirth that they never had before. These things came into play because they gave in to temptation. They went against God's will. They sinned against God himself directly. And now they have to pay the price. They have consequences for that sin. We've lived out those consequences as men ever since. That's not the end of the story. So what I'm going to ask you to do is we know that there's risk and we know there's temptations coming at us. What I want you to do, I want to train yourself that when you're tempted, pre-decide to stop and ask yourself, what could go wrong? Because something can always go wrong. The big question is, if you can pre-decide to ask yourself is, what if the worst case scenario comes true? We're going to pre-decide because we're going to be ready because we know the devil's coming for us. We're weaker than what we think. So when we get close, when we get close to that line, we're even going to right then and there think about, oh, should I step over that? No. No. Uh-uh. What's the worst thing that could happen? What if the worst scenario comes true and you may answer like, well... We could lose our reputation. In the church, we could lose our ministry. We could lose our integrity. We could lose our jobs. We could lose a loved one. We could financially find ourselves in a wreck. We could compromise our relationship with our wife or our husbands or our kids or whomever. Consequences. 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 A wise pastor you always used to quote, quote this verse. He said, you'll be sinning against the Lord. And he said, your sin will find you out. It's going to come out. You will be find, found out. Now, there weren't any kind of gray areas in there whatsoever. And it sounds pretty ominous, right? So what you want to do is you want to ask yourself, what's the worst possible thing that could happen 
and then magnify that cost. What's the worst possible thing that could happen if I cross that line and I start sinning? Magnify that cost. Lose our integrity. Lose our job. Lose a loved one. you got to magnify that cost. That will help you pre-decide to do not to do what could hurt you later on. You want to move yourself away, move that line away from those consequences of sin and temptation. Say to yourself, I could lose every bit of credibility, every bit of spiritual authority. So listen to me good today. Five minutes of sin could wreck a lifetime of pursuing Jesus. And so what we're going to do is we're not, we're going to recognize that. And we're going to have a spiritual enemy who's going to come and attack us. So we're ready. We're on guard. When he does attack, we're going to move the line. We're not going to be stupid and be way out there. Right? Oh, I hope I don't get in trouble for this. Oops. No. Before that happens, we're going to move that line back. And we're going to put that safeguard in place. We're going to put that boundary line in place. And we're going to magnify that cost. And the greatest thing we're going to do is, see, we're going to make an escape plan. We're going to plan our escape. We're going to decide ahead of time how we're going to get out of any temptation that our spiritual enemy brings at us. We're going to plan our escape. One of the things I used to teach in my class was if you plan, fail to plan, then you plan to fail. And that's absolutely true. If you don't go into any situation, whether it's business or school or relationships or anything, and you fail to make a plan, then you plan to fail in that job, in that school, in a relationship. It's not a fun place to be. So we're going to plan our escape. The best illustration of this comes from the Old Testament, a guy named Joseph. Now, if you don't know who Joseph is, let me describe you who Joseph is from the scriptures. So I'm going to read this. This is what the Bible says about him. Okay? So, the scripture says, Joseph was a very handsome and very well-built young man. Hear that, girls? This is the Bible. I'm telling you. Okay? And the scripture says he was very handsome. So here's this good-looking guy, and the scripture says, Potiphar's wife, now this was kind of his boss, okay? Potiphar's wife soon began looking at him lustfully, noticing, hey, you're very handsome and you're very well built. And so she said to him, come sleep with me. Now, imagine how easy it would have been for Joseph to give in. Think about it. Probably this is what was going through his mind. He was saying, well, this isn't my homeland. My brothers don't even know where I am. We're all alone and nobody's going to find out. And this is a good, good looking woman that's flirting with me. And I'm young, and I'm single, and she made the move, so it must be okay, right? And so what he did was he, he went through all these steps, knowing that it was wrong to start with, but he was trying to justify that temptation. He was justify, man, I really want to really cross that line. I really want to cross that line, because this temptation is a pretty good one. So I want to cross that line. So he could have done what many, many people do, and he could have justified bad behavior. He could have just given in because he wasn't happy with God, and really in his mind he wasn't doing anything wrong, because he wasn't doing anything wrong when his brothers beat him up and threw him in a pit. He wasn't doing anything wrong when his brothers sold him into slavery. God let those things happen to me, so... Here I am, I'm in, I'm in a bad situation because, you know, God let me down. And so often we feel, well, since God didn't do what I wanted him to do, then I'm going to do what he doesn't want me to do. And I'm going to sin. I'm going to give in. And that's why we have to be vigilant against temptation. Don't ever use this excuse. The very thing many of us do is we use our disappointments to justify our disobedience. To justify our bad behavior. To do the things we know are wrong, that we know are dangerous, that in the end we're going to be found out, it's just a matter of time. That sin is going to come screaming at you at some point in time. There are consequences for every decision we make. 
Let's see what happened here. Let's go on with the rest of the story. We're going to do the Paul Harvey thing here. So we're going to do the rest of the story. So what happened with Joseph? So Joseph had pre-decided that he was going to honor God. She came on to him and he faithfully resisted. He told her, no deal. No, I ain't going to do it. And Joseph was thinking, hey, your husband trusts me as a man of God. How can I sin against him? How can I sin against God? And so he resisted. And what happened when he resisted? Well, you think everything just kind of went away? No. She kept coming on to him day after day after day after day. She hit on him. She made moves, tempting him, seducing him. And see, in the same way, day after day, the devil is coming on to you. Day after day, he's attacking because he, we know that he's coming for us. He knows that we're not as strong as we think. We're going to pre-decide, see, when that happens then. We're going to pre-decide to plan an escape. That's very important. I want you to hang on to that one. When you get into a bad situation and you're about to make a bad decision, pre-decide to have an escape plan. Don't make the decision. Escape first. Escape. So what happened? He resisted, and he resisted, and he resisted. So, you might think, well, look at Joseph. He was strong. See, I'm here to tell you, he wasn't really very strong. But he did, he was smart enough to pre-plan his escape. Because the scripture tells us one day when they were all alone, Potiphar's wife came to him and she's not just saying stuff, but she actually grabs his coat and tries to tear it off him. And the scripture says that he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. What did he do? He ran out of the house. He left the coat in her hand and ran out of the house. And why? Because he knew it was better to have a good name not to fall into temptation than to have a coat. Than to have a coat. He had an escape plan for this scenario because he decided my name is more valuable than any kind of possession. My relationship with God is worth more than any kind of possession. And he determined ahead of time that if she grabs me, I run because I'm not strong enough to resist it. So I will run from it. I'm not strong enough to resist it. So I will run from it. He had an escape plan. And because he had been faithful walking with God. The amazing thing about God is. When you're tempted. And you will be tempted. The good news is. For God is he is always faithful. He is always faithful. He will never. Never let you down. And he will never let you be tempted. Beyond what you can bear. And the good news is when you're tempted, Scripture says, He will always give you an escape. Every single time. Every single time. There's no temptation that the devil will bring your way to which God hasn't given an escape course. There's no lust. There's no financial temptation. There's no breach of integrity. There's no relational loss in which God hasn't already said, there's a door. There's another way. So in my call to worship, I chose this for this very reason. Psalm 16, 8 through 11 says, I know the Lord is always with me, and I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. No wonder my heart is glad and I rejoice. My body rests in safety. For you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. You will show me the way to life, granting me the joy of your presence and in the pleasure of living with you forever. God gives us that promise of escape, that promise of protection, that promise that we will have a glad heart. He's not going to let us sink down into that pit. He's not going to let us succumb to temptation again remember you have to make that choice you have to pre-decide so we pre-decide ahead of time we choose ahead of time the devil is going to attack 
I'm not as strong as I think. So I'm ready. I predetermined to move the line. I predetermined to magnify that cost of what it would cost if I did sin. And I predecided when she grabs my coat, I run out that door. I pre-planned my escape because no one plans to screw up their life. But people do it every day. People do it all the time. No one plans to screw up their life. But most people simply don't plan not to. And so we have to be on our guard. We have to be ready. And what I want you to do is I want you to be incredibly honest about where you are vulnerable. How and where does our spiritual enemy attack you? I want you to think about these next questions. Is this you? Is it in your pride? How do you justify sin because you're mad at God? Well, if God hadn't have done that, I wouldn't be doing this. Do you find yourself compromising financially because you put your security there or you love the bling that money buys you? Do you lie sometimes to make yourself look better or do you gossip about people to make them look bad to make you feel better? Do you judge others? Are you overly critical? Are you carrying unforgiveness in your heart? Do you find yourself giving in to lustful temptations again and again and again, looking at things or even acting in a way that you know is dishonoring God and your relationship to God? Do you find yourself taking God for granted and one day you just wake up and now you know your faith is just lukewarm? You've let it slip so far. Your faith is now lukewarm. You used to be passionate about the things of God. But now you're not passionate about the things of God. Do you find yourself compromising around your friends? That you're one person at church and you're somebody else around other people. I've seen it so many times. These are all tough questions. But what you have to understand is these are real life. These are real life. What do you do? How are you going to choose? Choose wisely. Choose wisely. So what we're going to do is we're going to be ready because our enemy is going to attack us. We're going to put a distance between ourselves and temptation because we're no, we know we're not that strong. We're going to decide ahead of time how to stay out of trouble when the devil attacks. And you're going to ask yourself, why have the need to fight off something then that I can eliminate now. In other words, why do I have to face this in the future if I can eliminate it now? Why would I resist temptation in the future if I have the power to eliminate it today? The devil is coming from you, for you. He's going to try and destroy your reputation, your witness, your ministry, your friendships, your relationship to a spouse, your witness before your kids. The devil is coming for you and you're not as strong as you think. So what are we going to do? We're going to be on guard. We're going to be watching and praying. We're going to be ready because we're not as strong as we think. And we're going to pre-decide to move that line. I'm not going to get as close as I can be to get into danger. I'm going to stay far away. We have to pre-decide that ahead of time. I don't need to face that in the future. So I'm going to stop it. And before I'm tempted, I'm going to magnify the cost. What's the worst possible scenario if that could happen? Why would I even go there if I know what could possibly happen in the future? Why even go there? And then ahead of time, we're going to plan that escape. See, and all this is based on those foundational values that we talked about. Because when our values are clear, our decisions are easy. When we have those foundations in of who you are, where you're going, who you want to be, those I am statements that are commitments, that are foundational, right? They're based on our values, and when our values are clear, our decisions are easy. 
And so on from that moment and somewhere in the future, when you're tired, you're hungry, you're angry, you're overwhelmed, you're emotional, you're depressed, and you know at that point in time you're most vulnerable. Your decision when you're tempted won't be based on the emotion of the moment, but on those values that God has placed in your heart. So what do we do? We commit all our ways to God, our relationships, our friendships, our finances, our witness, our plans, and our thoughts, and our words. We commit them all to God, and He will establish our plans. And our plans will succeed. The scriptures tell us that. And because we know His Word, we know it's true. We decide ahead of time when I'm faced with such and such a scenario. I've already determined in that moment, I will choose to honor God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you, Mark. Hopefully, me leaving my phone there will not distract you since it has the score of the Vikings game. <laughs> Oops, too late. Cross that line. Oh, I had to move it out of the way. So. <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to move it out of the way. You know, and, and I mentioned this a couple weeks ago, and, and it fits again this morning because when we pre decide things, you know, there's this line there. How many years did Judas walk with Jesus? He walked with him the entirety of his earthly ministry. But yet Judas pre-decided to cross that line. And Mark asked if anybody had a regret about a decision that they've made. And we know he did, because what did he do? He took the coins back to the, the religious leaders and he threw it at them. He regretted what he had done. And this is the way that Scripture records it in Mark chapter 14. It says, In the evening, Jesus arrived with the twelve. As they were at the table eating, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, one of you eating with me here will betray me. And in my mind, there's that pre-decision. Somebody's already decided that. And the disciples, greatly distressed, each of one asked in turn, am I the one? And he replied, it is one of you twelve who is eating from this bowl with me. For the Son of Man must die. As the scriptures declared long ago, but how terrible it is, or how terrible it will be for the one who betrays him. It would be far better for that man if he had never been born. Mark continues and says, As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and he blessed it. Then he broke it into pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take it, for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks for it to God. He gave it to each of them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice for many. I tell you the truth, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new in the kingdom of heaven. And Mark concludes this section by saying this, Then they sang a hymn, and they went out to the Mount of Olives. body of Christ broken for you. And the blood of Christ shed for you. Father, we know from your teaching that Jesus, Judas ate as well. But we also know that Jesus gave his life so that we can turn our lives around. So that we can pre-decide right here, right now, that we will follow your Son. That we will allow the Holy Spirit into our hearts, 
and we will let this Holy Spirit guide us and direct us through the rest of our lives so that we can truly answer the question that we ask so often here, life ends, eternity, where? Thank you, Father, for the message this morning. Thank you for just teaching us how we can come to you in pre-decision and decide ahead of time that we will not cross that line. In Jesus' name, amen. As we come into our time of prayer, normally we would have Denise up here, but she took seed this morning to St. Luke's. And we were just praying that they could figure out what is going on and uh, get him on the road to recovery for that. Some additional requests of prayer that we have. Um, good friend of the ministry, her husband helps us with orange track racing, Pam Stone, who is not only uh, had a stroke within the last year, but now is fighting cancer. She retired this past week after 18 years at CRST because her body can no longer take it. We'll also be praying for Mark, who's going to be, he gave me his schedule for the next month, <clears throat> the days that he'll be traveling, and he'll be traveling quite a bit. So most of the month of October and November and December are yet to be announced. So uh, just prayers for travel, because I know you're going to be all over the Southeast and probably down into the area that was affected by the hurricane, and that would be another one of our prayers this morning. We want to just lift up all those people that were affected either directly or indirectly from Hurricane Ian, uh, specifically in Florida where the devastation is just incredible. And then also in South Carolina because Ian decided to come back in and give one more hit. So there are people that are missing and presumed And Danny, we're also going to pray for you. I know it's your birthday, but we're going to pray for you because I know you want to take a trip and go down and see your sister in St. Louis. So we're going to pray for safe travels uh, as we do that. Is there any other prayer requests that are out there? All right. If you're watching online, please drop us a note in the comments. We will absolutely put those onto our prayer list and be praying for you uh, in the coming week. And we'll just add that to our prayer list. So, Father, as we come before you right now, we lift up Steve. Uh, we pray for his healing. And we're thankful that uh, Denise was able to get him to St. Luke's this morning to get the treatment that he needs. We pray for Pam as she continues to fight cancer and also as she goes into a period of mourning. 18 years is a long time to be at that position, and I know how dearly she loved her job. Pray for Mark's travels. As he gets into his car and drives everywhere that he's going, we pray for safe travel, both that he's able to navigate the roads and navigate those that are out there on the roads, and that he's able to get the work done that he needs to. We pray that Denny's able to finally get this trip down to see his sister Kim in St. Louis and spend some time with her. And Father, we lift up the people of Florida and South Carolina and everyone who was affected by this most recent hurricane both here in the States and down in the Caribbean where it's starting. Father, we just thank you that you give us an opportunity to pray for our brothers and sisters that we are free to do so without worry. Father, thank you for the message today. Thank you for these requests. Guide us through the coming weeks, months, and years. In Jesus' name. brings us to the end of our online portion of our service today and I thank everyone for being with us and I know this was kind of a long sermon today and uh, kind of testing you to see what your spiritual fortitude was I guess uh, <laughs> uh, we still have treats over here too so I'm gonna tempt you with those uh, how do we overcome temptation is we need to understand that God is with us always in and through everything and we need to understand that we need to turn it over to him. Uh, the music that I chose for today, I would invite you to go through because each one of the songs that I chose that we're going to listen to here 
um, has to do with exactly what the message talked about today. So pray with me this prayer, if you would. Holy Lord, who sent your Son to save us, I pray to be reconciled to you today. I pray to live in Christ and to let go of my worldly desires and instead follow where Jesus leads. May be I may be new in Christ and be reconciled to you, O Father, and forgiven of my sins through your great mercy and grace. Loving Father, thank you that your word is powerful and effective. It is living and active. You have promised that I do not need to be anxious about anything, but in every situation, I should present my request to you humbly with an earnest heart. I lift up my relationship before you today, Lord, and ask you, you bring re restoration and healing to that relationship. Replace my fear with faith in you. May your peace, which surpasses all understanding, guard my heart and my mind in Christ Jesus. Heavenly Father, thank you that there is nowhere I can go that is beyond your presence and fill my relationships with the peace that comes from your presence. Your word says that my faith will never be put to shame when my trust is in you. Give me faith in your power to restore my life. I humbly submit my life to you today. Please help me to trust in you with all my heart. You are the sovereign King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in inapproachable light. You be honor and eternal glory through Jesus Christ, our Lord.